We are now ready to discuss the final chapter of life, death. Yeah, death and taxes. Well, we already done the taxes part. Now it's time to do the death thing. <laughs> Does anybody really want to think about the day that they're not going to be here anymore? There's an old um, uh, Sufi uh, saying, Good master, good master. How do I learn to live? And the Sufi master said, young, young disciple, you learn to live by preparing for your death. And the disciple says, well, well good master, how do I prepare for my death? The Sufi master says, learn to live. <laughs> I like it. What is estate planning? Your estate consists of everything you own. An estate plan is how you set up to administer and distribute your property during your life. Those are called gifts. Or after you are demise, after your demise, after your death, and that's called an inheritance or a bequeathment. Estate planning is not just for the wealthy folks. If you own a home, especially in California, or you have children, you need estate planning. Now listen to me carefully. Nothing in this presentation is meant to be construed as legal advice or legal recommendations. I'm three years of law school and one bar exam from being able to give legal advice in the state of California. We are giving you information and we will over and over again say to you, you need to consult a <laughs> bar certified uh, attorney in your state of residence, in our case, California. Estate planning includes both building your estate, which is what we've been discussing, right, throughout the, uh, the chapters uh, regarding uh, uh, investing and, and retirement, and then transferring your estate upon your death, your estate upon your death. Most people give little or no thought to putting their personal and financial affairs in order for their families that survive them. You need to name a guardian if you have a child, and you need to uh, discuss the distribution or state uh, you know, catalog, the distribution of the personal belongings. The demands of daily living can keep people from thinking about death. Plus, as we said, it ain't fun to think about your own mortality, is it? No. Plan while you're in good health. Many people will procrastinate until some life-threatening illness or near-death accident or experience scares them into acting. Don't be one of them. Estate planning is especially important for non-traditional households and businesses. If you're in a relationship where you never bothered to get married, but you've been together for 20 some odd years or more, talk to a lawyer, please. <laughs> especially if you own property together. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, you have kids together. Yes. You need to talk to a lawyer. If you have children from previous relationships, boy, can that get... Uh, sticky, blended families. And then certainly if you're in a relationship, in a partnership relationship, in a business, yeah, you need estate planning. You need to talk. And you, and hopefully if the business or the partnership is, is, is thriving, uh, you've been, I'm sure you have been <laughs> solicited that, you know what, you need some, 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 uh, some legal help here, folks. Because what happens if one person dies? Or we already talked about the life insurance issue. But, you know, unless there's something set up, the heirs are going to get the, their part of the partnership and maybe they don't want it. Maybe they, maybe they want to sell it then. What's the, the, the surviving partner going to do? Oy, 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 oy. Estate planning. Should you hire a lawyer or go it alone? Did we already say something about taking out your own appendix? No, folks, no. <laughs> don't do it alone. You can. Some people will. I had of a friend who was, we ride bikes together and we're riding and while we're riding, he's a very competent individual, but he's asking me all these questions do you, do you, about, about estate planning. I say, well, we have a chapter in our, you know, principles of money management class and we discuss the various aspects, but we really say you need to talk to a lawyer. So he's asking me all these questions about his particular situation. And I kept saying, Job, that's not his name, Job or, you know, <laughs> Gob, you need to talk to a lawyer because I can't recommend anything. I can tell you, you know, what I know about him. And finally, another uh, 
companion who rides with us, she's a doctor. She says, you know, Gob, he's telling you, you got to go see a lawyer. And then he says, I'm not going to go see a lawyer. I can do it myself. And I thought, oh, boy, I just, I, I ain't saying another word. Well, guess what? You can do it yourself. There are um, uh, pre-printed forms, very good programs out there. One of the best ones is NOLO, NOLO.com. This guy's been around from way before the internet. And he was, I'm not sure if he's still alive now, but he was a lawyer who was really upset that, that people were being charged a lot of money to do very, very simple things that they could do on their own. So he started writing, he started creating the forms and writing books and now, of course, software and online. And then there's Do Your Own Will, H&R Block, Legal Zoom. what a great name, and I'm sure there's many others. So if you need a will, you know, expect to pay up to 500 bucks. If you need a trust, they've gotten a lot more expensive. You used to see these $495 trust, everything included. Well, I don't believe it. Now it's $595. You see these signs around the town and in the newspapers. And we'll discuss the difference between a will and a trust and whether or not some indications will tell you beforehand, before you go see the lawyer, whether you are uh, a candidate for a will or a candidate for a trust. But again, that's why there's lawyers, folks. You know, be, There's lots of lawyer jokes. Yes, I know. And actually, most of them are true stories. But anyway... Before it was lawyers, how did we deal with uh, problems and, you know, legal issues? Uh, pistols at dawn. So I'll pay the lawyer 250 bucks an hour or whatever so I don't get shot at. Slide 41. What estate planning involves? Well, create, review, and update your will, your trust, etc. on a regular basis, especially if you get married, divorced, or moved to another state. There's a document called a codicil that is used to amend an existing estate document. But usually if one of these major events happens, you're probably going to start all over again, talk to the lawyer. You want to name an executor, and we'll talk about what the, 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 um, the, the job of the executor is in a bit. Consider creating and managing a trust or trust. Uh, most all Californians would benefit from a trust once they get over a certain amount of assets under their belt not to be construed as legal recommendations or advice. Yes, prepare, prepare a letter of instructions, which really has no legal standing, but it can be helpful um, with things that you, know, you don't want the courts to have to deal with and the lawyers have to deal with uh, personal effects and the like. Organize current financial records and documents and let family members know where they are. There's, it's, a, it's a cliche that seven years after the guy died, they turn up a life insurance policy or something like that, or a, or a, um, you know, it's a stock certificate that they stuffed underneath the, in a drawer somewhere. Make an inventory of your estate. Well, you've already done that in chapter two. Remember your net worth statement? On the net worth statement, it would be cool to have the telephone numbers and the individuals that you, that the um, executor, the people uh, who, who survive you can contact. On ours, on our net worth statement, I have all the account numbers for my wife, and I, because I mostly do all the work, and you know, and she, I mean, I, I, I've reviewed it with her many times, but she'll take over because I assume I'm going to predecease her. But you never know, you know, you just never know. But financial investments, retirement accounts, the where are the deeds to the real estate, business interests, insurance policies, any collectibles, which, you know, usually aren't worth that much, but maybe yours are. Uh, we know somebody who passed away with thousands of dollars worth of silver. Beautiful stuff has to be cleaned, but somebody's going to want it. Important documents such as Social Security and veterans documents and the like. Yeah, let people know where they are. What about a will? Now you hear, we hear, of course, we lay people who we hear about the will. Well, what is a will? It's a document. It's the legal declaration of a person's mind as to the disposition of his or her property after death. Sound like a test question? All right, so it's really straight out. Who gets what, right? Marriage, divorce will affect your will. Marriage may revoke your will depending on the state. 
review your will with an attorney. If you marry or divorce, they're probably going to say, look, we need all new estate planning documents. The legal cost to prepare, prepare a will vary with how complex it is. Now, I don't know if this $200 is, is um, no, worth, worthy, but figure four or 500 bucks, maybe more. And although I strongly recommend against it, you could probably do your own will without creating a legal nightmare for your heirs. And unless you really should have had a trust, okay? And of course, who's going to make that decision? Well, we're going to learn uh, some of the easy things to ask, easy questions to ask that might intimate that you need a trust in the state of California, or maybe your state's different. Definitely your states are going to be, every state's going to be different. But you need to consult a lawyer. But again, if you don't need a trust, then you could probably do a will without royally screwing things up. All right. Now, intestate. Intestate. Well, that means you die without a will. And somebody says, well, he died intestate. What, what, did, that, ooh, did he have his clothes on? No, 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 no. It just means you died without a will. And then the state takes over. The state has a will for you. The state decides on a guardian for your children. This can be a mess, folks. Very complicated if you also have a blended family. Somebody at Southwestern, a, a, you know, this guy should have known better. He had a lot of property and, you know, he was a well-respected professor. He dies without a will, without anything. Oh, my goodness, his heirs just had such a hard time. So don't, unless you really hate the, the, your children or your your grandchildren or whatever, then go ahead, die intestate, okay? But uh, don't do it. Probate is a process. The probate court, probate court validates the wills and makes sure that your debts are paid. In some states, California being one of them, people will try to avoid the probate process by using a trust. Specifically, it's called a revocable living trust, or just a living trust, or a, um, a what's it called, inter vivos trust. And we'll, we'll, t we'll take a look at these in, in further, in more detail further on in, in the slides. And on the board, in a face-to-face -face class, I would have will on one side of the board and trust on the other side of the board. So, you know, you don't have that. But think about it. Put it on a piece of paper. Will on one side, trust on the other side. Choose an executor. Find out if the executor first is willing to accept this major responsibility. Just don't name somebody like your brother without talking to them, right? Find out if he or she is capable and trustworthy. If you don't name one, the court will name one for you. Not the best alternative. Being an executor is a serious responsibility. Choosing an executor is even a more serious task. You can have co-executors. You can have one uh, as the your friend or family member and one the attorney or a trust company and then what happens is the the attorney the trust company will make sure everything is done correctly and you can have your friend run around and do all the legwork and pay them 50 bucks 70 bucks an hour just because you want them to be happy because you don't want them to be cursing you and of course the attorney <clears throat> will make sure that the important tasks are done correctly at 250 bucks an hour but it's worth it dear students yes what does the executor do well they get your checkbook they wind up, you know, they're, they're in charge of the, of the uh, assets. They take control of the assets of the estate, file an inventory of assets and liabilities, sell any assets if necessary to pay off those liabilities, and then distribute the assets according to the instructions in the will. They make a final accounting to the court, and that is that. The co-executors or the executor have tremendous power. There are countless stories of abuses of that power, so please choose carefully, especially if somebody's not responsible, folks, because, because you know, you're dead. You don't know what's going to happen, but they might, they might really do some things that are illegal and wound up in, in you know, legal issues, criminal charges and the like. So don't tempt people who, who aren't responsible. Choose somebody who's very responsible individual and, you know, talk to them first about this serious responsibility. Okay, enough said. Selecting a guardian. Oh boy. Even if you don't have many assets, folks, if you have children or you have a child, you still need a will at least 
to name a guardian. Again, not to be construed as legal recommendations or advice in the state of California. Consult a bar certified attorney at law. The, guard, the guardian assumes the responsibility for providing the child or children with personal care and managing the estate for them. Be sure the person is willing, able to raise them. Just don't assume grandma can do it. She might not be up for the task. See if their values and child rearing practices match yours. Talk to the child when they, if they're old enough, uh, because uh, some situations the child might not want to go with grandma. You know, they might. Uh, every situation is different. So this is a you know this is I think you know more important than the property are the children that you would sadly leave behind if you were to die prematurely. The prenuptial agreement. Now, this isn't. This really is not part of estate planning, and and this is a separate issue. But since we're talking about legal stuff, let's throw it out there. This prenup agreement waives rights to each other's properties that was acquired before the marriage. You're basically when before you're going into your marriage, you're agreeing on a settlement if you should divorce. Ugh, not something people want to talk about, right? They're getting married. They're going to spend their life together. Maybe not. Often not. Very important for couples who already have children or assets or both, at least talk to a lawyer about the advantages and disadvantages of a prenuptial agreement before getting married. And if your would-be spouse refuses to even discuss a prenuptial agreement, that should serve as a disturbing omen. Don't say I didn't warn you. Now, folks, I'll admit I was married once before, and so was my current wife. She was married once before, and she was interested in a prenup agreement. I said, all right, but we don't really need one because if this one doesn't work, I'm going to the monastery. <laughs> I'm going to be a monk and forego all worldly assets. She laughed, but I was... I wasn't kidding. I was like, okay, I don't want to go through this again. If I do, I'm never going to touch it. I'm never going to get involved with another person again. Yeah, right. Anyway, so remember, if they don't want to even talk about it, especially if you've been married before or you have property going into the marriage, that's a bad sign. What's the most important financial decision you will make in your lifetime? Right, who you marry. Now, what's a living will? Um, actually, you hear advanced health care directive more often now, but I still call it a living will. It provides for your wishes to be followed if you become so physically or mentally disabled that you are unable to act on your own behalf. Now, typically, when you go to a lawyer for estate, estate planning, they will have this as a throwaway. It'll just, they'll, just, they'll include it. In fact, our um, legal classes... We had a legal, um, I'm not sure if it's still intact, but we had a legal club here at Southwestern for um, you know, people going into the legal profession. And they would give these out to people. They would have a, you know, a day where they would be in front of the uh, student union and saying, here, here's your advanced directive. And it was very cool, actually. Discuss your living will with those close to you. Sign and date it before two witnesses. Give copies to those that are close to you. And it requires careful thought. Actually, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> oh, sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember, but some of you well, don't remember this, but there was a very famous case in Florida where this woman was in a coma for, what, 16 years? And the doctors were saying, look, it's doubtful she'll ever come out. And she's hooked up to machines and costing you know tens of thousands of dollars every year. So the husband finally said, okay, uh, let's... Um, Let's, uh, you know, let her go. And the parents, no. Oh, no, you can't do this. And it became a cause celeb, a national cause celeb. If she had filled out a living will, exactly, there would have been no, no uh, um, legal wrangling. She, may, she would have made the decision, look, I'm in a persistent vegetative state. Isn't that a great way to call people call <laughs> Call you a vegetable, a persistent vegetative state, and indeed, you know, there, when they had uh, did the autopsy, they said no, there was no way that her brain was ever going to work again. Ugh, okay, slide number fifty: a power of attorney. Another document that often the um, the the uh, lawyers will help you create uh, when you do your estate planning, and the durable power of attorney for healthcare. 
This is a legal, the power of attorney is a legal document authorizing someone to act on your behalf. It can be limited or it can be uh, very broad and give the, uh, the, power, the attorney power of gr great deal of power. The person doesn't have to be an attorney. It can be your brother or your anybody and and this is something that the the um the military if you go on on um on the deployment they'll often make you do this so that you have somebody back in the states or wherever you happen to be who can actually act on your behalf but again choose carefully because they got your checkbook and there are countless examples of people coming home and having everything gone because the Spouse or whoever, girlfriend or whatever, or boyfriend just disappeared with all the money. The durable power of attorney for healthcare is the same idea, except it's for medical decisions. If you're unable to make decisions regarding your healthcare, this authorizes someone to do it for you. So again, these will usually be thrown in with the mix by your attorney. And then this document, slide 51, is not legally enforceable. It's, it's called the letter of last instruction. It's just for information, you know, some things like a lamp or something like that that you knew your nephew really liked and you just wanted to make sure he got the net, the, the lamp. Instead of putting it in the will and, and having the courts and the attorneys have to deal with it, you just tell the executor, hey, give the lamp to, to, to my nephew. My father's name was the same as mine. I'm a junior, believe it or not. And he had this beautiful little gold-plated... Um, uh, card, you know, business card carrying, and my aunt, who was my father's executor, just gave it to me and said, "Here, you know, it's not worth that much. Um, it's not gold; it's gold plated. <laughs> so maybe it's worth twenty, thirty bucks in gold. I don't know." Um, the letter of last last instruction provides heirs with information about the funeral ex preferences, who should be notified where things are so that the executor can easily deal with them, who gets personal effects, as we said, that are of little value, that it would just be you know, ridiculous to have, the, have to have the lawyers and the courts have to deal with. So check out a letter of last instruction. And my wife said to me, if she predeceases me, I better have good food at the service or she'll haunt me. So that's, that's what you put in the letter of last <laughs> instruction. Okay, now, all right, on the one side of the sheet of paper, you have wills and all the stuff we talked about, the executor and the probate and the intestate and all that stuff. Now, on the other side are trusts. Trusts are tricky. <laughs> you go to law school, you spend a lot of time discussing trusts. And there are dozens and dozens of different types of trusts. A trust is a legal arrangement through which a trustee holds your assets for your benefit or that of your beneficiaries. The trustee takes care or manages the property on your behalf. But there are some trusts where you are the trustee. Hmm, interesting. It distributes your assets to your heirs from the trust after you die according to your instructions. So if you're not the trustee, the trustee is still alive and, and they do it. If you're the trustee, then there is a successor trustee that takes over when you pass away. All assets are taken out of your, not, not all, but most all important assets are taken out of your name and put in the name of the trust. Now, some people create the trust for themselves, like my friend Gub. You can do this, but if you screw up... <laughs> Your actions can result in outcomes that range from typically useless to potentially disastrous. Okay, now, can I give you an example? All right, here's, here's the deal. You download the forms or the software program. You create the, the trust document. You fill out the forms and you, you take it down to the county admin building or wherever they want you to file it. You file it, you pay the whatever the, the filing fee is, $18 or $81 or whatever. The trust is created, and it's a legal entity in the legal world. But then what people fail to do is they don't fund the trust. That's the phrase they'll use, fund the trust. They don't take the assets out of your name and put them in the name of the trust. For example, your home. 
your home no longer is in your name. It's now in the name of the trust. But it has your name in there. It'll be the you know John Smith uh, Family Trust or something like that, or the, the Smith Family Trust or something like that. Okay, if you don't do that, if you don't fund the trust, then what you did was useless. It's as if it, it, you didn't do anything. So what you did was useless. Okay, well, it didn't help. But if you do it incorrectly, if you create the wrong trust or you, you fund the trust incorrectly or whatever, I'm not sure, I'm not a lawyer, folks, but I know that if you do it wrong, you can be in deep kimchi. Now, I like kimchi, but boy, it's stinky, right? And that's what you can wind up with. You could just lose control of your assets or worse. So please don't be like gob. Get a lawyer. <laughs> now, why? Why would you want to trust? Why go through all this problem of picking up your house and putting it in the name of the trust? And then you being the trustee and incurring all these, these uh, legal expenses? Well, in some states, California being one of them, you want to avoid probate. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to see why in a little bit. It can reduce your estate taxes. Depends on if you're married or not married, but it frees you from managing your assets if you are, you know, not willing or able emotionally or mentally to deal with them. Or you can be your own trustee and you manage the assets, and that's very typical. That's the revocable living trust, the inter vivos trust, as we'll see. You can provide income for a surviving spouse or other dependents. Trust can be extremely helpful for people whose children or grandchildren are either disabled or emotionally unprepared for a windfall inheritance. I know somebody, uh, I haven't seen him in many years now, but at age 18, he inherited $800,000. It was gone in three years. <laughs> if the parents had put the, the uh, assets into a trust, the trust provisions could have said, look, he gets, you know, 5% or 10% a year for the next 10, 12 or whatever years. And then if there's anything left when he turns 30, it's all his. And that's, uh, that's called a spendthrift provision. Uh, because young people often, or not always young people, some people are just not emotionally prepared for this grand sum of assets to land in their lap. And that's where trusts really shine. Look at all the different types of trusts out there, folks. And these are just some of them. But the two most important ones for the vast majority of us are the revocable living trust, also called inter vivos, which is a fancy way of saying while you're still alive. And then AB trust, which is, I think my understanding is not as important anymore. The AB trust was usually used for married couples. But now I think it's been rolled into, I don't want to talk to the lawyer, but I think it's been rolled into the uh, the revocable living trust, the living trust. Now, what do you think this one does? Generation skipping trust. All uh, right. <laughs> it's sort of self-explanatory. Self, uh, but how about private annuity trust? What What is that? Or or testamentary trust. Or I even say that right? You see why you need to consult a lawyer? Right. Okay, good. Now, California and living trusts. Revocable living trusts, inter vivos trusts, AB trusts are very common in California and used to avoid probate and reduce estate taxes. If you're a California resident who owns property or has any substantial net worth, your estate will mostly likely benefit from some sort of living trust, not to be construed as legal advice. <laughs> Legal fees range from $1,500, $2,500. Please don't try to do this on your own. Why? Let's say it again. If you screw up, your actions can result in outcomes that range from typically useless to potentially disastrous. Don't take out your own appendix. Slide 56. Here you go, folks. If the gross assets of the value are $200,000, and that means you own a house, no matter how, how big the mortgage is. And I think it's actually 100000 where it starts to kick in. But in California, they've set these minimum probate fees. So you have a house that's, you know, worth five or six hundred thousand dollars 
your heirs are going to pay at least twenty six to thirty thousand dollars in probate costs. And folks, typically probate is not that that not that complicated. So these lawyers are going to get a you know tons of money from your heirs for not a whole lot of work. It's actually kind of criminal, but again, before lawyers, pistols at dawn, okay. So the lawyers, you know, being lawyers, they set up this method called an inter vivos trust, which allows you to avoid probate. <laughs> Notice the fees with a living trust. So here you go, folks. They force us to spend 2000 or more dollars while we're alive so we can save $40,000 for our heirs. Oh, well, you know, that's the law. Oh, Shakespeare, it's nothing new. Shakespeare 400 years ago said, the first thing we do when we get in power is kill all the lawyers. He probably didn't say it. It was one of his older, later uh, uh, plays. And at that time, he was having other people write for him. So, but it's still, it's been, <laughs> people have hated lawyers for a long, long time. Assuming you find a good lawyer that sets up the trust correctly and funds the trust, you will not, your heirs will not spend any money on probate. And as I remember, I mentioned the gentleman from Southwestern, right, their heirs got hit with a huge probate fee. Oh, well. If you hate, as I said, if you hate your heirs, if you hate your children, your grandchildren, and so forth, go ahead. Don't do anything. Slide 57. Now we hear about the estate taxes, federal estate taxes and state inheritance taxes. Well, um, California is one of the states that doesn't have an inheritance tax. Other states do, but everyone's is um, potentially uh, susceptible to the estate tax. But the reality is it's a tiny percentage of the population, as we'll see. If you try to avoid the estate tax by giving things away before, you, especially big things, before you pass away, well, then the IRS has a surprise for you, okay? And there's a way to get around that if you talk to a competent bar, bar certified attorney. What did we say about tax avoidance versus tax evasion? There are some unscrupulous um, life insurance agents who will try to get you to use life insurance to avoid the uh, estate tax. Of course, they're only going after people who are very, very wealthy. The problem is you won't know if you got away with it because you'll be dead. Uh, yeah, right. Because <laughs> it's not legal. Uh, reducing the size of your estate through charitable requests is one way to uh, get a tax break before you die and then after you die. And then if there's taxes owed, typically the taxes have to be paid. Most debts against secured assets such as a you know, home or other real estate will need to be paid. But for example, credit cards usually don't go after you. If you have a lot of credit card debt and you die, they usually just write it off. Utilities are, I don't think they're allowed to do that. They have to go after the money because they're a public utility and you know, they have responsibilities to the taxpayers. But there are ways, many options to plan ahead and deal with these issues. So Here's the federal estate tax exclusion amounts through the years. What does this mean? 2017, and it goes up, it had gone up with inflation. The first $5,490,000 that you bequeath to your heirs is tax free, no estate tax. And of course, if you're married, double it. Well, in 2017, and one of the things that the you know, Trump administration was trumpeting, was to get rid of the death tax, they called it. They called it the death tax. Well, some of the senators in the Senate said, you know, we shouldn't get rid of it. We're talking about people who are worth billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. So instead, they were only, only able to double it from 5,490,000 to 11,180,000. And it goes up with inflation. So in 2023, it's $12,920,000. That's what they can... Leave to their heirs tax-free, and if you're married, double that. It only affects a tiny percentage of the population, and many of them should have dealt with it. 
the Republicans will always trot, trot out the fact that some people who were farmers and never made a whole lot of money their whole lives were sitting on tons of land and they did not work with a lawyer to put it in a trust and to avoid the estate taxes. And, and then they, that family had to sell the farm and it makes for great news and you know, great headlines. But it's, again, a just a handful of people out of the 330 million people in the United States. And here's a wonderful quote that probably was said by Alberto Moravia, who nobody knows that knows, but it's also attributed to Charles Lindbergh that everyone's heard of. He flew first. First guy first flew solo across the Atlantic. Our ideals, laws, and customs should be based on the proposition that each generation in turn becomes the custodian rather than the absolute owner of our resources. And each generation has the obligation to pass this inheritance on to the future. Yeah, folks. I mean, there's a there's a whole ideal ideal um, in in Christianity and other religions that we're we're not we don't own anything here, folks. We're just the stewards. We're just holding on to it for the future generations. And of course, this is you know mocked by by uh, the culture these days who. who idolize billionaires, which in my humble opinion is very sick. <laughs> they pass gas out of both sides of their body just like the rest of us. But uh, some for some reason we think billionaires are much smarter than the rest of us. And, uh, and I would say that you know, sometimes it's just dumb luck. Other times it's uh, perseverance to the point of, you know, <laughs> uh, abusing your employees and the like. But still, it's time to give back, okay? It's not yours. It's all of ours, and we have to... There's that old um, um, American, um, Native American idea of think about seven generations ahead, the seventh generation. We're here because seven generations before us worked to make us, you know, available, make, make our lives available living now. And so we now have to think about seven generations ahead. I like that idea. I like that idea. Speaking of inheritances, <laughs> the greatest transfer in the world, well, the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of the world will begin shortly as we baby boomers start to die off. $41 trillion over the next 50 years. And if nothing is done, some very, very wealthy individuals you know, having hundreds of billions of dollars, will wind up paying six trillion dollars in taxes. And they're still working diligently to get the Republicans to kill the estate tax completely, but hopefully that doesn't happen. Two thirds of it will go to people who are already wealthy. Uh, I ain't one of them, are you? <laughs> so if you're one of the lucky ones who will be the recipients of an inheritance, how do you deal with a windfall? You know, you suddenly receive 300,000 or 500, 800 or 1.2 million or whatever. You think you're one of the rich and wealthy. You're set for life. Or are you? The average Jane or Joe lottery winner, winner whose life was ruined by winning the lottery has become a cliche. And you hear people say, well, it was a fun three years. <laughs> uh, another woman, I wish I would have saved this. This is, it was a... Um, an interview on the radio show called uh, uh, Sound Money, but it's gone now, where a woman uh, won the lottery, $700,000, and I think she was either 24 or 27, and it was gone in three years. She took her friends and family to Disneyland for a week, $45,000 a week in Disneyland. Um, we saw the illustrations. With this kind of nest egg, we can create a growing stream of income that will last us a lifetime. But people don't think that way, right? They haven't taken our classes yet. And then there's the disasters that happened. The one gentleman in the South who won, I think, over $200 million in the lottery gave tons of money to his granddaughter who he adored, and she wound up dying from overdose. There's the legend of King Midas come to life. <laughs> you destroy that which you love the most because of wealth. What would you do with a windfall? 
Well, here's our recommendations for what they're worth. Change your lifestyle very little. We asked you that question. What happens to you? Would you be happy? Well, it turns out if you're happy before you get the windfall, you'll probably be happy afterwards. But you're going to have, as the saying goes, more money, more problems. I don't like the term problems. I like more responsibilities because now you are given more. So you do have more responsibilities. And be careful of acquiring a sense of responsibility for family and friends and even strangers because they will often expect you to share your windfall with them. How much are you going to give me? Consider not touching the money for six months. Just store it away. Find a trusted financial advisor. Whatever you do, realize that this is it. <laughs> this is the one and only inheritance you will receive from dear Grand Aunt Trudy. Don't squander it. And now, the final instruction regarding estate planning and for Business 121, Principles of Money Management for Spring of 2023. What it's going to be? What's the final one? Let's try to go get a lawyer and get a good referral. Dear students, I can't tell you how incredibly honored and grateful and happy I am to have been your instructor for this class. And I just love to start at the start at the ending and begin at the, the end at the beginning and start at the ending. I, uh, as we go back to the very first slide and look at a perspective, it is a gloomy moment in history. Never has the future seemed so dark and incalculable. The United States is beset with racial, industrial, and commercial chaos, drifting we know not where of our troubles. No one can see the end. Do you remember? Do you remember when this was written? <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Um, yeah, 1847. <laughs> uh, almost 200 years ago. And look at what we've done. Many people say our best years are behind us. I disagree. If we can come together politically, stop treating each other like enemies. That's a big if. Economically, I'm very, very optimistic about the next 20, 30, 40 years, and I'm old. Usually as you get old, you get more pessimistic. I'm optimistic. But I won't be around. <laughs> but you young folks, you start putting 100 bucks a month away in a global growth and income fund, and the world doesn't end, you can thank me, I hope. Yeah, we'll see. Finally, it is a gloomy moment in history. Never has the future seemed so bright and promising. The United States is the most racially diverse, industrially strong, commercially prosperous nation in the history of the world. Of our continued success, no one can see the end. Now, now who said this? When did they say it? Me! <laughs> now! Yeah, I'm optimistic about the future. I'm looking forward to driverless cars. I don't like driving. I'm looking forward to curing cancer. Yeah, I'm looking forward to universal translators. We can go pretty much anywhere in the world and talk to one another. Yeah, we'll see. Thank you all for a great semester. Don't be a stranger. Visit wonderprofessor.com. We'll, as, as long as I'm alive, we'll, we'll be up and running. You can always get in touch with me, and the material is always there for your uh, perusal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We wish all of you the best of luck and success in the future. And you know how I'm going to end, right? Whatever you do in life, don't give up. Never give up, dear students. Thank you very much for a great semester. See ya.